may have new faces in the room, new people in the room, and that these uh, new members of the family are requested to introduce themselves quickly. And I would like to ask Torsten, maybe, I saw you have not been there, and there's the microphone with Shobana. Shobana, please give Torsten the microphone. We have a new guest, and please point at those who have not been here. My name is Stefan Reuter from Borda, and I'm happy to be hosting that session. So, hi, my name is Thorsten Kiefer from Wash United. And you know Susanna since when, Thorsten? I know Susanna since maybe since the beginning. Since day one, 2007. Yeah. Yes, yeah. great. Uh, as we are not yet complete, one sentence, what is Wash United doing? Wash United works on um, MHM, hygiene, advocacy, um, education, yeah. Great. Good to have you here. Who else is new in the room? Okay. My name is Bolua Titoawe, um, United Purpose Nigeria. Um, I've known Susanne since 2014. Mm -hmm. And um, United Purpose works in um, rural sanitation and hygiene promotion in Nigeria. Um, a little bit of water supply as well. All right. Yep. Welcome. We have a third person here. Yep. My name is Chris Zurbrick. I'm from Airwag Sandek, um, Switzerland, and founding member. Since maybe? the very beginning, right? Since 2007, I guess, isn't it? Excellent. Yeah. So welcome, Chris. And with these three new members in the room, I would like to welcome you to the session which is entitled Citywide Solutions, Sanitation Systems in Cities. We have three exciting presentations. Um, one is looking at citywide sanitation with an equity lens. Uh, that will be presented by Zachary Bird from Columbia University, looking at experience in India. We will have a presentation from Airwag, a joint presentation from Abhishek Narayan and Linda Strande, planning for citywide inclusive sanitation. But to start with, we're looking at a new kind of emerging cities coming from an emergency situation. And I'm really happy to introduce you to Andy Bastable, who is telling us the story about sanitation in the new city of Cox's Bazaar, Myanmar refugees and Bangladesh. Um, and he has over 20 years of practical experience. I was reading your publications on um, sanitation solutions back in, in Bangladesh and many other parts of the world. So you are heading the or our senior advisor on the water and sanitation sector of Oxfam. And we're really uh, keen to hear from you how fecal sludge management is working in Cox's Bazaar. You take the microphone. Is there one on your? Yeah, it's working Th these are not working. Ah. Now is it on? Great, Andy. Yes, right. So um, what I wanted to just kind of run through is something's changed in the world of emergency Sorry. sanitation that um, for the first time ever, we've seen a proliferation of final de deposit sites for faecal sludge management. Um, we've never seen it on this scale ever before. So um, in Haiti, there was a big hole in the ground in Trutia. Um, that's all it was, big hole in the ground. Um, in the Philippines um, response to Hurricane Haiyan, there was um, some lime-based treatment. Um, in Myanmar, um, during the floods in 2012, more um, lime-based treatments. And then Cox's Bazaar. Um, this is the context. Huge, uh, we've got nearly 900,000 people and this is the mega camp the fourth largest city in Bangladesh, um, on little ha hillsides, um, lots of um, landslides, and then you've got the um, monsoon at the moment. And then you've got agencies doing toilets. There's about 26,000 pit latrines at the moment in Cox's Bazaar. Um, these are the different sort of volumes. 
And you could say that when I arrived there last June, um, people hadn't done the calculations on how long their pit latrines were going to last. So they were putting in very shallow ones because it was all about speed. And then in a few weeks, because here you'll see it said based on 20 users. Well, some of these in the, in the early months were getting 100 users and they were being filled up in three weeks. And then they're dead because there wasn't any desludging and there was nowhere to desludge it to at that point. So, kind of the various strategies, you know, we, we kind of thought as Oxfam that on-site treatment has to be the answer. So we kind of naturally went towards what we've been doing in many different countries, tiger worm toilets. And on the, the right here, you've got these um, impermeable, um, sorry, permeable um, platforms that go in an ordinary culvert, concrete culvert latrine, which is the standard in uh, Bangladesh. Um, and then you've got bedding material, and then you have the worms um, which live on the bedding material. So it's a tiger worm toilet, vermicost toilet. So, um, you know, we thought it has to be, we don't want desludging, we don't want final kind of uh, waste treatment sites. Um, so we started um, you know, partnering with Biofill, um, doing an in improved uh, Biofill model. Um, then other agencies got Practical Action doing an um, anaerobic uh, filter. This is just another example of what I'm calling sort of on-site treatment. Um, uh, this is um, WaterAid's um, uh, vertical um, uh, infiltration bed, which had a few problems in the, um, the monsoon time. Um, various agencies have done Biogas, that was mainly for the old caseload, though not so much for the new caseload. Because um, you have to remember that the Rohingya started coming over in somewhere around 1991, 1992. Um, and then uh, other sort of initiatives, septic tanks, and um, we as Oxfam have been experimenting with this, um, the, Indian in the Indian Military Institute bacteria um, that is supposed to eat 100% of all the solids so that you get a completely liquid effluent out of it. Um, and then the bit that we haven't talked about, desludging. So you have got mechanical desludgers. Um, also, you've got many, many hundreds of people carrying um, barrels of kind of desludged kind of fresh poo to various sites. Now, these sites is what we're calling the decentralized sites. Oh yeah, this is another um, example. This is kind of what Oxfam was doing in waste transfer stations. So from that tank, um, you would desludge straight into it from the pit latrines all around it in the valley. Um, and then that would get pumped to another um, of these uh, two cubic meter tanks and then to another one and then to a lime-based treatment. Um, and then this is um, Solidarité um, and Oxfam doing different models of lime-based treatment, mixing it in, drying it, and then we got to a point with the Oxfam model where we could burn the, high, the dried out um, kind of lime and excreta together to produce pretty much nothing. So from you know, many, many cubic meters of waste to just ash, we thought was pretty good. You know, we are thinking about reuse, but at the moment we're just thinking, how do we get rid of it all? Um, we've also got um, mobile lime stabilization where it's not possible to actually get all the barrels a long, long different d distance to one of the decentralized um, fecal sludge management sites. Um, and this is, the, the, this is what we call the centralized uh, site. And this is something that um, Oxfam's done in collaboration with Border. Border did the design um, and Oxfam's doing the construction of, um, of this. So the whole brief to Border was to um, produce, do the, the design for the kind of a biological waste treatment plant that has the least possible operation and maintenance costs. We all know that the world's going to soon lose interest in the Rohingya and 
kind of the money from major donors is going to go down and down. That's normal in emergencies. So with the waste from 900,000 people, there has to be something pretty big to accommodate that and with little funds as time goes on. So this kind of eventually, when it's all kind of finished using from the, 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 um, uh, the um, initial lagoons to the cocoa peat filters, hopefully will be um, the less, you know, the, the minimum in operation and maintenance. Um, so kind of these are the, the parameters we're looking at in the faecal sludge treatment plant. I won't dwell on that too much right now, but it's 40 cubic meters a day is the, um, is the capacity. Um, and here's the list of technologies. So you can see where we've gone from a hole in the ground to different types of lime-based treatment in emergencies to now kind of decentralized um, biological, decentralized chemical, um, centralized biological and on-site treatment. You know, this, this is a huge array of different types of treatment. You know, it's, it's never, we've never seen this before in any, any emergency anywhere. Um, the ones in green are the ones that Oxfam are doing. That's just, um, but there's, you know, it's not, it's a whole bunch of different agencies um, doing this. Um, and then here we're trying to do a comparison. This is a short term comparison because we won't really know the success of many of these systems for about a year or maybe two years. So this is our first look at um, the summary of um, you know, what works well, what doesn't work well. Um, the idea behind the lime based treatment was that um, this would be a, a stopgap because it's easy, it's fairly easy technology. It's just a lot of manpower um, before the biological treatment plant is finished. And then we hope that some of those other smaller units of some of the um, vertical, um, vertical kind of filters um, will go out of commission and then it will all go to the biological um, treatment plant. Um, so along with this is kind of the technology selection. Um, and in this context, it has to be very resilient to cyclones. Um, you know, the, the monsoon at the moment isn't a huge one, so we haven't had huge fl flooding, not bigger than normal. We've had normal flooding, but it's still a big risk to any of these plants. Um, again, on the sustainable technology selection, um, these are the criteria kind of we are working to. So that's around, you know, that um, the environability, sus environmental sustainability, as well as actually um, kind of doing the job. Um, so yeah, a lot of it is about ensuring that we're not kind of further contaminating the, um, the whole area. So the next steps, um, kind of at the moment, um, uh, Oxfam with um, Biofill got um, 13,000 plus um, tiger worm toilets. Um, kind of, uh, we're working with Border as well on this idea of a, a sort of rapid response septic tank um, kind of idea that um, it's not specifically about Cox's Bazaar, but it's about uh, rapid emergencies where you have to do communal latrines. Of course, we want to get to shared family or family latrines as soon as possible for the ease of um, uh, operation and maintenance. But while we have to have communal latrines, can we do it better with um, uh, a, what, what they've designed is a, a bladder with baffles in, it has a biogas potential, and it has an in, quite an interesting um, infiltration gallery arrangement. Um, and then I think I mentioned around using the, the Gates Foundation funded bacteria that they did with the Indian Military Institute. And then urine diversion. For some reason in this response, there's been a real reluctance of the actors to get into various types of compost toilets. Hopefully that will change. Um, lime beds, yeah, we're also trying to bring in some lime based experts to actually professionalize what 
the NGOs have been doing on Lyme-based treatment so we can make it more efficient um, and make sure that we've got it there for the future for future responses. Because, of course, this is the challenge um, for all of this, um, is how do we gather all the information and all the good practice and all the practice that has never been done in an emergency like this before um, so that it can be replicated. That is the big thing. Um, and, yeah, I will um, stop there. Only to say that um, on the back of some of this um, sanitation work, um, Oxfam, in collaboration with Susanna, has done this... Um, it's a sanitation green card. So it's about the process of doing... Um, uh, kind of the toilets from start to finish and um, it started off as a green list checklist now it's gone into pictorial and there's a number of these on the table outside uh, and we're going to do an animated version um, so that for people in the field who only respond to animated things on YouTube or whatever that should respond you know deal with them as well so have a look at it it's outside on the table um, and I'll stop there thank you very much excellent Oh, there was one thank more. Thank you, you very much. Yeah. Please stay quickly on the stage because we have maybe one or two. The structure is like after each presentation, we have uh, up to five minutes. Right now, we have a little bit over time. The next presentation is going to start at uh, 20. So some immediate questions directly to Andy. Then we would have the time now. Otherwise, there will be at the closure 10 minutes, so I have two questions. I start with Diane Kellogg over there. Who can, can we have a microphone for Diane over there? Thank you very much. And then Arne up front here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy, for a lot of terrific detail about really important work you're doing. Um, I thought there was, I'm new to emergencies, so I thought there were constraints about building permanent structures when you were in that kind of setting, and how do you overcome that? Because obviously, you, you were able to do something that was slightly more permanent than latrines. Answer that one, sorry. Excellent question. Um, in the beginning, uh, kind of the authorities and everybody thought, no, they're not going to be here for long. We want them to go back. But now, finally, there is a realization um, that they're not going to go back in a hurry. So all the NGOs are thinking around 20 years. Um, the government's not saying that publicly, but um, it has allowed land for all these waste treatment sites. Um, and also we're planning a sewer system. Um, so I'm doing a pilot non-solid-free -so uh, sewer system. Um, so, and they're allowing that. And actually, kind of, um, they've been giving a lot of money, World Bank and others, into the government for them to do the operation and maintenance. So, that's a bit of an unusual thing also. So it's kind of credit to the Bangladeshi government. One, that um, they haven't been strict about the you cannot build permanent infrastructure. And two, that they're now taking on money, realizing that they're going to have to do the operation and maintenance in the long term. So things are changing. While we still think it's only an immediate response, it's already happening on the field. And I think this is what we're taking away from here. And if you have more detailed questions, please meet him afterwards. One question from Arno. I had noticed what is your hand up there, Arno? Are you having a question? Yeah, yeah but it's not your turn, so Arno. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, great, and thanks a lot, Andy. Uh, you, it's, it's a breakthrough, it's a surprise, uh, the first time that this is happening. So, does it, how is your perception? Now, in future catastrophes or situations, will that happen again? Or why did it happen? That's one thing. Is it, is it really the, we, we have changed as a sector, so this is... And the other thing is, um, how can we harvest that and how can Susanna be helpful that this is used in the future? Or what could be the, a positive role of Susanna? Yeah. All right, and I'm, 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 I apologize, this is the last question. Please meet him later on in the break. And here's your answer. Okay, crucial question. I mean, we have put a lot of thought in about why is it that we have such a proliferation of different types of FSM technologies. And I think it's many things. But one, you had agencies that have been there a long time, since 91, 92, and started doing things that we don't... It's becoming 
more common, but some things that aren't very common, like the biogas, like the vertical filters, so practical action, water aid, uh, NGO forum there, started doing these things for the old caseload, which we could see as more development type things. So therefore, the experience and the individuals that had done it, although a lot of them then moved to the international NGOs, um, unfortunately, sort of, they brought that experience with them. So it's partly that. It's partly things like there's a number of technologies um, in Cox's Bazaar that have been kind of um, uh, spring-offs from the Gates reinvent the toilet um, kind of project. Um, there's been kind of an appreciation over the last sort of five years from a lot of major donors that there should be more attention paid to sanitation. So I think it's a, a combination of, of those things which are why we've seen a kind of a, a big difference. Now, how is the big question, can this be replicated in an area, say a big refugee camp type thing in Africa, um, where there won't be so much money available um, and kind of it could be a harsher environment with the government, stuff like that. Um, this Actually, is um, please shorten your This answer. is the challenge, <laughs> but I do think, yeah, by documenting the pros and cons of each one and costing it and doing BOQs on it and doing the whole operation and maintenance, that kind of providing the evidence to donors, you put your money up front, you pay a, a bigger capex and you're going to get a smaller opex by three years, five years, I think all that evidence is something that Susanna can help in properly documenting or people doing M uh, uh, PhDs. Exactly. So thank you very much, Andy. A big hand for Andy Bastable from Oxfam. And please, for all of you out there, don't forget to type in your questions. We have online uh, representation so that we can also take them into account. And uh, for all of you who are excited by the emergency and relief work within Susanna, uh, please, uh, we, we are welcoming volunteers to join as a co-lead for this working group. So um, with this, I'm excited to uh, introduce you to our next presentation, which is a gender balance uh, presentation. So from the Swiss, um, um, Institute of Aquatic Science, Airwag, Sandek, we have Linda Strande, who is uh, responsible for the fecal sludge management work, which is helping all of us getting <laughs> the baseline data in order to design the right treatment systems for them. And we have Abhishek, who is uh, also doing his PhD at um, Airwax uh, and at the Swiss University of Aquatic Science. Um, he will be looking at the challenge from a more citywide inclusive sanitation perspective. So with this, please, the floor is yours. Yeah. And a round of applause, please, for the next hello, presenter. Hello. Thank check, you. Check. Test. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Abhishek, as he just introduced. I'm sorry. just starting my PhD. It's been six months and now. Since you're all sanitation experts, I'm not going to take time to justify why citywide inclusive sanitation. We all know rapid urbanization, sanitation infrastructure backlog, etc. Uh, but more about how this came about, this term citywide inclusive sanitation. Uh, we know that uh, during the 2016 workshop in Atlanta, this major uh, call, uh, people decided that we need to integrate planning and they came up with a call one year later. A consortium of partners, uh, some of you are here. Uh, and then earlier this year, I started my PhD on the same topic. Um, within this umbrella, there are several other efforts going on with these individual partners. Uh, and I'm going to talk a bit more about the planning aspect of citywide inclusive sanitation. First of all, um, since 1996, there's been a lot of work that's been done on this topic of how to plan for urban sanitation. Uh, until now, more recently, the UCLTS. Uh, but so there's plenty of work. These are the most relevant ones that I've chosen. Um, but if you notice, all of these are either top-down planning or bottom-up planning heavily. Although individually, they've kind of mentioned that you know we have to integrate top-down and bottom-up. Nobody has really gone to see how it's possible or is it possible at all. Um, within the scope of my research, these are some of the things that I'm hoping to do. First, um, define what citywide inclusive sanitation means. 
it, within within the uh, the brochure, the, the call for action that came out, it it gives a sense of what it could be. But operationally, we could probably define it more, and there there's more possibilities of customizing that. Uh, and the methodology. Let's be clear here that citywide inclusive sanitation by itself is not a methodology, but rather it could be a state that uh, that developing cities could try to strive towards. And we still need a methodology, which I'm hoping uh, um, within within their several existing frameworks which are already there, we could try to see how this top-down and bottom-up planning could, could integrate itself to facilitate itself as a, as a, as a combined bridged approach. Uh, and to help facilitate this, inter, uh, this, this sort of uh, uh, bridged approach, I think an innovative landscaping study could kind of facilitate that. Regarding my focus region, uh, well, you all know that India has been sanitation in India has been uh, receiving unprecedented uh, attention so much that there was even a Bollywood movie made on it. Mm -hmm. Highly recommend you guys watch it. Uh, but I'm taking four city, four or five cities into consideration to a understand how sanitation planning is currently happening between a mega city and a secondary city. Mega city we all know is well defined, more than 10 million people, but there are there are probably tens of secondary cities in India where the institutional setups, the demographics, uh, the uh, informal settlements, etc., hugely vary. So this sort of uh, um, distinction between these two contexts would be extremely interesting to understand as well. To dwell just a bit deeper into what I view as an, integra uh, as an integrated landscaping study is we could do it at three different levels using some of the existing methods and also probably thinking about modifying some. Uh, at a city level, uh, an SFD could also, SFD is well established, everyone's using it, but could we also think about aerially doing it so that we can identify some priority areas and also get this big picture view if we view things more aerially. And then at a ward level, which is the smallest administrative unit in most developing countries, we could probably also think about, SFD says how, how fecal sludge is managed, but we don't know, I'm sorry, F SFD says if it is managed at all, and we don't know how it is managed, what sort of technologies are being used within a context. And I think that sort of mapping could also be really interesting. And then finally, at a neighborhood level, to help with community engagement, uh, we could think about co-producing knowledge and the sanitation zoning techniques, which are already in place as well. Uh, there are also some new tools which are being uh, developed as, as we speak. One is a systematic alternate sanitation option generation. Uh, and then there is also another spatial planning tool called Urban Beats, which is currently used for, for uh, uh, a stormwater drain system, but we are also working to make it for sanitation as well. Uh, and we also have Linda's FSM q and about which she'll go into in a minute. I just wanted to finally make a quick statement saying that Suzanne is an amazing network and I'm really happy to be a part of it. So, could we think, also think about finding nexus within Susanna and to see if we can uh, synergize some of our efforts to do this? And these are already some of the efforts which are going on, which we are in talks with to see if we can find nexus with them. Thank you very much. Okay, Abhishek mentioned the Q&Q &Q method. I just wanted to give you a super brief introduction. This is a method we've been developing based on our research, and it's a method to estimate quantities and qualities or loadings of fecal sludge at scales relevant for planning and management. So from a community scale all the way to a citywide scale. And this is gonna be a chapter in the forthcoming methods book for fecal sludge analysis, and we also have some journal publications. I have some copies with me if you're interested please talk to me after. So I live in Zurich. This is a picture of the beautiful Lake of Zurich. And I want to ask you, if I ask you how many fish are in this lake, tell me how you could estimate that or guess that. How many fish are in the lake? Or what if I even asked how many species of fish to make it more complicated? Nobody has any ideas? 10. Ten. <laughs> so for me, this is a great analogy of the, of the challenges that we face when we have to quantify and characterize fecal sludge. It's underground, we can't see it, there's no existing records of what's there or how it's managed or maintained. But at the same time, we can have methods to estimate it as we can for the fish. 
So these are the logical six places in the service chain where we can make estimates of loadings. Number one is excreta production. Number two is fecal sludge production. Number three is actual rates of accumulation. So not the total amount that's produced, but over time what is remaining. Four is fecal sludge that's emptied, but not transported away. Five is fecal sludge that's emptied, transported, but not delivered to treatment. And six is, of course, what we want, collected, transport, and delivered to treatment. So number three, the actual seat in C2 rates of accumulation is the very most difficult to estimate. But for long-term sustainable planning, it's the most important. And why do we need to have these numbers? We need to be able to adapt to rapidly growing cities that we're working in, but also with time, the dynamic way that the sanitation structure and infrastructure is changing. So we need to be able to have these estimates at each step in the surface chain so we can make reasonable designs for infrastructure and management solutions. So now this represents a centralized sewer-based system. And you see the houses there have a lot of variability. But as this wastewater is transported in the sewer, it's relatively homogenized, making it much easier to predict what's going to arrive at treatment facilities. In contrast, this is fecal sludge. So at the household, we see it's also a lot more variable, and it's also not homogenized during treatment. So what we need is some type of weighted average that we can estimate for communities for planning. So I make another analogy here. This is similar to concepts we have in ecology. So if I asked you, how do you model the population of these crickets moving across a field? Would you take one cricket into the lab and look at it under the microscope? No, because that would tell you about that one cricket. It wouldn't tell you about the population. So again, we need to average out the complexities so we can model the population. So people want a quick and easy solution, and what they're typically doing now is just taking a few grab samples and making averages to then predict for large areas. But fecal sludge does not follow a normal distribution. And what we see here is influent values at Lubigi for wastewater and fecal sludge. And you see wastewater is much more diverse, two orders of magnitudes higher. The wastewater is much less variable, and so we need, they follow different statistical distributions, so we need different solutions. So we're using SPA debt data as predictors to make these weighted averages. So SPA stands for spatially analyzable, and debt stands for demographic, environmental, and technical. And this is, not about, this is about using statistical relationships or correlations, not causation. So you see there a map of the income level in Kampala. An income level can actually be a predictor. So in poor areas, maybe the systems are less well constructed. And in high income areas, maybe there's more uh, septic tanks or more water usage. So income level is not the cause of those characteristics, but if it's, it can be used as a consistent predictor. So this is the method that we've developed it's iterative with when we wear our research hats, we want to tell you to collect a large number of samples so it's statistically significant. But we know that in reality, practitioners have very limited resources. So we made the method to be as accurate as possible while reducing the required resources and having this iterative approach that can be built on. <clears throat> so rates can be measured in various different ways. In the field, that's covered in more detail in the chapter. This is one method that we've developed for in situ measurements, the full laser device. And I'm just going to quickly say, because I'm out of time, that um, this is some from, from some of our field testing. And what you see on all the y axes is total solids concentration. And what you see on all the x axes are the different types of spot at data. And you see there's statistical differences among them, and these differences can be used to build models and predictors. And one final last way that we could greatly decrease costs and resources is to use other types of statistical relationships. So for example, this is the relationship between COD to total solids in Kampala. So hypothetically, you could have a sampling campaign 
where you did extensive sampling and only measured total solids, which is relatively easy and inexpensive. Then you could have a representative number of samples where you sampled both CD and TS to get the correlation and then extrapolate that to all of your other results. So with that, I'm out of time. I want to like to say as we, we've um, tested this in a number of cities, this year we're also implementing it in India and Nepal. And we know that as we get more data collected, we can also reduce the number of samples that are required. And so that we're also looking for collaborators that are interested in also testing our method in their own projects. So if you're interested, please look at our website or contact me directly or afterward ask me for some of our information more about it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. I hope this works. Yes, we can hear each other. Thank you very much, Linda. Thank you very much, Abhishek. And um, because we want to keep in time and we have 10 minutes at the end, please, everyone who has a good question, keep it for our final discussion right now. Just one sentence. Why I love what you presented, Linda, is that we are, as engineers, asked to come up with good numbers for good design systems. But if we don't know what we are getting at the point of treatment, the likelihood of having too big or too small a plant is very high, even higher than the performance of treatment systems, which we as engineers often are so fascinated to work on. So that was a very great and important input. Know your shit, right? Okay. So with this, I would like now to come to the last uh, of the three presentations. I would like to call up on the stage uh, Zachary Burt. Zachary is a research fellow at the Columbia University and will present on sanitation and equity, focusing on how shit flow diagrams can be linked to equity. So, um, Zachary, we met a few days before. I'm fascinated with the, your approach. The stage is yours, and please tell us your story. You switch it up, yeah. Is it on? Yes. You can hear me? Okay. So, thank you very much for that. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, my name is Zachary Burt. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Columbia University. Um, as I said earlier this morning. Um, so this is a new project. It's a large collaboration. Right now it's a small project, but it is a large collaboration. Uh, GIZ, uh, also my advisor, Isha Ray at UC Berkeley, myself, um, Professor Narayanan at IIT Bombay, uh, close colleague, Sharda Prasad at Azim Premji, and then uh, regular collaborators in Hubli Darwad, the Center for Multidisciplinary Development Research. Um, we're collecting data in two locations as we speak, in Aleppi, Kerala, as well as Hubli Darwad, Karnataka. Uh, just briefly, I want to bring up the idea that there is a difference between equality and equity. Um, so in the sanitation sector, I would posit that equality is some basic level of access um, that everyone gets, whereas equity is more looking at uh, how can we create more targeted uh, subsidies, how can we look at how there's a differential impact of um, sanitation access, but also I think sanitation uh, exposure within the sanitation network. So talking about uh, SDG 6, in particular 6.2, which has to do with uh, sanitation and hygiene, and looking at uh, access, but also finding ways to make it equitable. Um, I would say that we need to go beyond uh, what's typically looked at, which is focusing more on access. Um, in the sanitation ladder, which obviously everyone is familiar with, originally developed for the MDGs, an extra rung was added, I think with, I would argue within this framework of access, of looking at safely managed sanitation systems. I personally believe that uh, this, is trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. This is trying to look at safely managed as another type of access. Whereas I would say that looking at what happens beyond the access point is going into the realm of exposure, which is, um, I think, something else entirely, but also important for equity. But just looking at access, uh, we can see that 
Uh, even that can tell us something about inequity. Uh, for example, comparing urban and rural areas in India, we can see a large discrepancy there. Uh, even within urban areas, um, large cities versus small cities, we can see a big difference there as well. But going beyond access means talking about what happens to the fecal sludge, what happens to the wastewater after it's collected and goes into the network, transported, what have you. Um, and so here, uh, these are just statistics talking about uh, sewage treatment capacity for larger cities and smaller cities in India. Um, there's obviously a lack of capacity, as people know, but the idea here being what happens to people within that city when the waste isn't treated. If you are just um, doing improvements that moves the shit around, then obviously that's going to have impacts on equity. Within the sanitation service chain, um, what we've identified is points of exposure. Um, and we're not trying to estimate risk. We're not trying to estimate the total cost of impacts. We're just looking at who is getting exposed, um, just as a first cut focusing on equity. So here we're looking at groundwater contamination from um, open bottom pits, for example. We're looking at piped water contamination from uh, cross-contamination with the sewer network. We're looking at just direct contact with open drains. We're also looking at flooding. You know, so that's something that I think um, isn't currently being incorporated into the uh, shit flow diagram um, since it's seasonal in its effects. Uh, and we're also um, trying to gather data on uh, whether or not sanitation workers and farm workers involved in reuse have proper training and proper protective gear. Um, so far, we found that oftentimes they don't. So SFDs are great. Um, they're easy to make. They're a good starting point for policy uh, design and debate. Um, and they're a visual diagram which makes it easy to identify sanitation gaps. So we would really like to build on these strengths in order to try and um, create something that would instead focus more on equity. So we want to look at, um, for underground drains, who benefits from the subsidized cost, but also who is burdened at the end of the drain. Uh, with septic tanks, we want to look at who is using groundwater and also who is treating their drinking water. So if people are using their groundwater, but they're treating it, then that's not a point of exposure. But that may not be the case in more marginalized communities. And then lastly, we want to look at flooding as well and find ways of trying to incorporate that into some sort of um, uh, uh, metric or uh, visual diagram. Uh, our goal is to highlight social inequities, economic externalities, and issues of environmental justice in sanitation system upgrades. Um, we're trying to, as I've mentioned, create a modified SFD, uh, but we're also looking at possibilities for other types of visual diagrams. Um, this is all very preliminary, so I would really appreciate any feedback um, any of you might have on both our approach overall, but also our proposed uh, outputs. So just an example, this is not based on data. As I said, we are in the process of collecting data right now, but we might create a modified SFD where we look at access and exposure and break it down into relevant socioeconomic categories. So for example, up here, we might break down um, this first top category being uh, off-site sanitation is the label there. That's anyone connected to a sewer. We might break that down into uh, wealth quartiles, for example. And then the same thing for on-site sanitation as well. And most likely, we'll see some discrepancy there in terms of how those things are allocated among these wealth quartiles. Uh, other possible socioeconomic categories in the Indian context might include uh, religion and caste. Um, we also thought about trying to break this down in terms of gender. Um, so we're looking at what possible categories might be most relevant. Um, and then, ah, okay, so let me speed up here a little bit. Uh, for gender, uh, we've found just anecdotally that um, the gendered impacts for households that do have access to a private toilet uh, were not so pronounced, but we are f uh, finding some gendered impacts at the workplace, at schools, and when traveling. Um, and likewise, we're looking at workers, as I mentioned earlier, and trying to see um, 
what are the socioeconomic groupings that are being exposed in sanitation work? Uh, so just a couple of examples, qualitative examples of what we're trying to quantify. Here we see an apartment building uh, which has a, this is not black water, this is a gray water uh, drainage pipes that then uh, release right into an open drain at the point where this woman who lives next door is collecting her drinking water, doing her washing, and washing all of her dishes. So these are the kinds of um, impacts uh, uh, from one group to another, often of different socioeconomic groupings, uh, classes, uh, that we want to try and characterize. Um, another example, as I've mentioned, uh, in one of our sites, Hubli Darwad, we've roughly estimated that around two-thirds of the current um, uh, fecal sludge that is collected is being reused in agriculture. Uh, by and large, this is not being treated before reuse, and by and large, the agricultural workers that are uh, being exposed to this reused uh, fecal sludge uh, do not have any protective gear, as you can see here, not e in some cases not even shoes um, and certainly not gloves. Uh, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. Uh, last example here, and I think this is maybe the most uh, interesting because it's uh, got a, a couple of hidden gems. Uh, what you, you can probably notice first here uh, is this uh, low-income area right next to a higher-income apartment building. You, if you're really observant, you might have also noticed uh, this open drain with just some slabs covering it. Um, and then in this threshold, you'll see a small concrete slab uh, across the doorway. That's to hold back the flood water when it, this drain does start to overflow. You might also notice this uh, pipe right next to the door. This is where this family accesses their drinking water. The thing that you might not have noticed, well, which is the whole point of including this picture, is this drain right in front of the apartment building here. You can see how high this maximum is, where the cover is. So although if you just looked at investment in the sanitation network from the perspective of this drain in front of the apartment building, you would categorize that as benefits. Your accounting would be, oh, this is a benefit for all of these people in the apartment building. What you might miss is that if you draw a line at the top of this drain across the entire picture, you can see where the maximum flood level is and how uh, this drain investment actually had quite a bit of negative impact on their neighbors right next door. Uh, so these are the kinds of things that we want to start incorporating into some sort of easy to comprehend visual diagram. Um, in order to uh, track uh, inequities in the sanitation system. Uh, so here's my ta contact information. Uh, if we don't have time right now, uh, please uh, send me an email. I would really, uh, again, I would really love to uh, hear your questions and feedback. Well, maybe there's th yeah, a round of applause for Zachary Burt. Thank you very much. Um, we are starting our final discussion uh, 10 minutes to 2, so there's uh, at least for one question, immediate question, time to Zachary, who would like to uh, come up with a question for his work or maybe a comment. Otherwise, um, is there some question from the uh, online community? One question from Ada, great. Thank you very much, Zach. Very, very interesting. Um, one quick question. I noticed that from particularly from the pictures, and they say pictures speak a thousand words. Most of the pictures you've shown us are like um, very informal slum communities with, you know, you can see, definitely tell the income levels of those dwelling in those places. I'm just asking, in trying to do this kind of work, at the back of my mind, I'm thinking about regulations and whether the people that live in those environments originally should be there and, you know, in terms of putting all of it in the framework of city planning and all of that, that kind of really trying to understand in addressing inequalities or equity issues in the, within the ranks of, um, of a regulation and guidance and all of that. What's been your experience with that? Yes, in trying to, you know, you're highlighting the issues now, but if we want to address these issues, regulation will come in. For instance, what has been your experience? Have you thought about that regulation and equity issues? Uh, uh, so, I mean, the focus of this project is really just to then to create a tool for, uh, I would say, planners and for local regulators. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, so the, the goal of this uh, development of this tool has really been to create something that could be useful for people that are trying to answer, I think, that, that question. So I, I, I'm hoping that it will be uh, useful for that community. Uh, I, I personally don't have, I think that, you know, the answer to your question really depends upon the local context and is a much larger question, much more complicated. Um, what, what, what I'm hoping for is that um, we can create something that uh, isn't so burdensome and might be picked up by uh, the people that uh, deal with this problem. Um, yeah. So what I'm hearing there is um, your question goes more into the corrective action while your tool is putting evidence on and, and, and providing information. Are we investing at the right spot? instead of improving the situation for those who already have some privileged situation. So helping prioritizing um, investments, if I may take it that right. way. Yes, yeah, I mean, measurement, I think, is the first step. So that's what we're trying to do here. Okay, thank you very much. I think we come to a closing discussion. And I remember that there was one hand from Arne in the beginning to our first presenter. But I would like to collect those questions. I have seen the hand of uh, um, Claudia as well and from um, Roland so we have three people lining up and uh, we ha do we have a second microphone for our presenters so that we can have a quick answer so here comes your question <laughs> to Andy Bastable I guess it was uh, it was Andy and in fact I think Abhishek may have some um, aspects to answer there it has to do with um, organic solid waste and how uh, fecal sludge management can be integrated um, in some way with that enormous load of, of solid waste that is coming out of these refugee camps and also cities. Um, especially when you're looking at some ecosan applications, uh, even things like pyrolysis and composting, um, biogas. We only have one microphone, so it's better you come in front here. <laughs> Andy, for your answer. It's been talked about quite a lot and um, in the Gates Reinvent the Toilet um, discussions, these various kind of plants that take this, the organic waste, any other solid waste and all the faecal waste and burn it to create gas to, you know, tr um, create electricity, highly expensive. So to do it on a low cost sort of way, then composting is the obvious answer. Um, but we're getting different waste streams. The waste streams from all the, refu uh, the IDPs in the ha Haiti earthquake in 2010 is very different from what we're seeing in the Rohingya, with the Rohingya. So you get, and what we're seeing um, in the, 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 the um, Syrian camps in, in Jordan and in Zatri, very different. So um, yeah, we all know there's, one, there's no one size fits all, but I do agree that there should be more attempt to do that but it's it's um there's a tremendous reluctance on some to have sort of urine diversion composting toilets mm -hmm. it doesn't always fit and you think um when we move on to these um, um centrifugal separators then maybe we'll have a bit more success um with that but um it, it's remains a challenge i think andy is there any kind of co-treatment of um human organic uh, resources and some solid, you know, liquid waste, solid waste. Trying to prevent the word of waste, sorry. But, uh, Cold, sorry. Co-treatment, ah. like solid waste collected from the camp and, and liquid waste, is there a co-treatment? Any? I've never seen that occur okay. so far. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, Claudia, your question. And then comes Roland. Thank you. No, it's not a question, just a linkage because you were asking from Colombia uh, related what uh, maybe some suggestions. Uh, one is from uh, Take the microphone close, w please. WHO. I don't know if you know the sanitation safety planning. So that is very close to what you are doing, identifying exposure groups, uh, health risk and so on. And I think that could be a good linkage. And the other one is what has been, do has been done in the European region is also a lot of inequities in, wa in the wash sector. Uh, this has been led by France and it's under the scorecard exercise done in a lot of Eastern European countries. So maybe there are some interesting linkages. 
please give him more details so that he can have the source of the information. Roland. Yeah, thanks very much. Well, I'm very intrigued by the presentation by Takari. And uh, I think it's extremely challenging what you are going to do. And I wish you really good luck and really hope that you will be successful. I think once you are successful, I, th I, I see a great potential that this is not only a tool for the professionals, for the policy makers, but also for the civil society. Because then they can go and actually make the government accountable what they have promised for equitable sanitation. And I think this is extremely important to give this to, you know, when I look at this uh, SFD, the improved or the expanded SFD, that gives a great tool for the civil society and say, look, here we are the ones who are suffering the most. So I, I really would like to encourage you to go so far that it's also understandable for the civil society. Thank you very much. And um, would you like to comment or give any feedback or it's just an encouragement and then we ask for more questions maybe for the presentation of uh, Linda and um, of Abhishek because they didn't have the opportunity to make use of their five minutes. So any questions for Linda and uh, Abhishek? Immediately or to the whole team. It, it probably means that uh, they either understood everything or didn't understand anything. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay, we have two more people. There is Patrick from GIZ and Antoine from SNV in the pipeline right now. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to comment on Abhishek's presentation. I mean, you said there are not so many approaches. Either it's bottom-up or top-down planning. But I don't know if you are aware of um, the program which was, or this project which was going on in Uganda, the Town Sanitation Planning Project. And um, that's an approach which is quite participatory. And we did town sanitation planning in six small towns. And of course, I can give you a lot of information on that. And um, yeah, this is, I think it's a good approach. It, 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 it even made it into the a ministry that it will be implemented countrywide now. So um, I think it's a quite interesting approach. Patrick, what Thank was you. the name of that approach? Um, well, it's we call it town sanitation planning. Okay. And it was a co-funded project um, with USAID. Yeah. And it went for three years. Uh -huh. And yeah, I'm, Thank I'm, you. I'm uh, ready to share information. Please go and meet yeah. Abhishek Thank you so much for that. after that. Uh, and Antoinette, your question. Yes. Um, well, for Linda's presentation, I think this is really interesting, but I also felt, oh gosh, I need to read that in detail first to fully understand the implications. Um, it's not because it isn't interesting. For Abhichek, I, I, I think that the issue is not only about bottom-up and uh, top-down planning, right? It's also that there's generally not uh, a real demand for sanitation. If you ask what is your priority to be fixed in your town, it's generally not the human waste. Um, and the other thing that we found which is very strong is that you can make excellent planning, but if the absorption capacity of the local uh, government, the local stakeholders isn't there, that really doesn't hold. So there needs to be some concept of progressive insight where you progressively uh, do planning. And, and I, yeah, I, I didn't see that in your presentation. Of course, you only had a few minutes. Mm. Can I say, sorry to Antoinette, my, pre my presentation was just meant as a quick teaser. Yes. And trust me, there's a whole book chapter you can read. Yes. I'll send it to you. Antoinette, you didn't present yourself to the whole community and I'm please sorry. wave to the camera behind there. So who you are? We haven't seen you before. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, my name is Antoinette. Okay. I'm from SNV. I'm the Global Wash Sector Coordinator from SNV. Great. Thank you very much. And now is your time for a quick feedback, Abhishek, from what you have heard. Uh, th thank you both uh, Antoinette and uh, Patrick. Patrick. Uh, Take this one. 
Yeah, thanks a lot. I haven't come across the and uh, case study, so I'd be really happy to get to know more about that. Uh, but a quick feedback was, I mean, this was too short to give a presentation five minutes, so I didn't go into some of the details. But one quick thing that I did want to mention is, um, so uh, for example, if you take the clues approach, there's a whole point of trying to ig ig ignition till implementation, so it really tries to see the process through. But one of the things that I do want to really dwell deep on is, I, I think that Every approach has a bit of an equilibrium between top-down and bottom-up. There's no approach which is singularly top-down or bottom-up, agreed. So one of the things that I do want to explore is how the context kind of affects it. For example, if it's an informal settlement that we want to look at, I think the, uh, the equilibrium will gravitate a bit closer to community planning, or that's how it should be, or if, if or to A, validate that. And maybe if it's in, in a peri-urban region, it could be a little more uh, top, top down because it's almost like a greenfield development. So, so to understand a bit of those dynamics is what I'm going through, but point well taken, thank you. So thank you very much. A round of applause for our presenters and we're closing this citywide sanitation session. Thank you very much. And with this, I'm calling for session number four.